Christmas is, is we call it Advent. Like, I, I've seen this thing online. It said, um, anyone who says Merry Christmas before the 25th is not really a Christian. <laughs> because it's actually between, you know, December 1st and the 24th, it's, it's really called Advent. We're waiting for the Advent. December 25th is Merry Christmas. Now, of course, I'm just joking about that whole, you know, you're not a Christian if you say Merry Christmas or whatever. The point is, we spend so much time during Advent remembering the birth of Jesus, as we should. But we need to also realize this is his first advent, his first coming, which implies what? There's another one. There's more advents. And so since this is the second last part of this series, I want to take the next two weeks to discuss the second advent, his second coming, and what that means. Yes, it's amazing God became a man, and we should ponder that, and, and we have, and we, continue, we will continue to, but let's not neglect that he's coming again. There's some implications here, like, wait a minute, does it mean that Jesus, the God-man who was resurrected, does that mean that he's still a man today? Like, is he in heaven as a man? Does it mean that Jesus, who is God incarnate, Yahweh in the flesh, will he be a man forever? Is God a man forever now as a result of the resurrection? Now, these are interesting questions. And I get to the manger and our ornaments in the, the nativity sets of the baby Jesus, and, and I think our celebration needs to reflect a little more his second coming as much as it does even his first coming. Now, imagine that Christmas tree. Imagine the Revelation Christmas tree. How cool that thing would look. Four horsemen riding through the branches, you know, the beasts popping out of the tree, uh, you know, the new Jerusalem ascending on, on top of the thing. Like, the, <laughs> the second coming Christmas tree would be an epic thing. It would probably burst into flames, but it would be a cool, a cool sight to see. We, we see from the Bible that the end times are irreversibly uh, bound up in this idea of a son of man. You know, you've, have you ever read your Bible and heard Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man? That's like the most common title he uses of himself, even more common than Son of God. He calls himself Son of Man. What does that mean? The, the, the Son of Adam who, who will rule and reign forever. Now, that might sound like theoretical, but this has huge implications for you personally. Personally. This idea of the God-man ruling on earth is tied up with your very purpose for existing. It's personal for you. And everything you do and say in life flows out of this reality. So church, we need to understand this. Your life is not meaningless in history, is not random. It's moving forward to a time when the scriptures tell us, a son of Adam will come in power and glory and rule and reign forever. Your purpose for existing is to be in that place and image God forever and ever. Christmas is a time when we need to reflect on our lives, what we're doing, and whether or not it lines up with our purpose. Because so much of our anxieties and depressions and hardships, not all of them, but so much of them, happen because we misalign ourselves with our purpose for, for being a human. And your purpose is this, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So look at Daniel chapter 7, if you would, with me, starting in verse 9. So Daniel is having a vision, and this is what happens. It says, as I looked... Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season 
and a time. Um, yeah, okay. Wait a minute. Was that the right passage? I think I read the wrong passage. No, that was the right one. Oh, sorry, I didn't finish it. <laughs> Verse 13, my bad. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and the glory and the kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion shall be an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one which shall not be destroyed. Okay, there's a little confusion there. I was like, how come this says this and this says that? So imagine if a foreign army marched into your hometown, into Windsor. A foreign army marches in, ransacks the place, kills your family, kills your neighbors, and then takes the rest of the living to a different land. Well, this is where Daniel finds himself here when he sees this vision. Here we have a righteous, God-fearing Jew forced to live in the midst of a pagan, ungodly society far away from his blessed home in Israel, far away from the temple of his God where he would worship. And some of us know the story of Daniel and how God exalted him to high positions in Babylon and how God saved him and his friends in miraculous, mighty ways. Look, if you haven't read the book of Daniel, go read it as soon as possible, the whole thing. It's like 12 chapters long. It's not too long, but it's powerful. Now, that would be like a bleak and depressing outlook, but God comes to Daniel in dreams and visions and shows him bizarre but incredibly hopeful things to come. So Daniel looks and he sees thrones set up and the Ancient of Days takes his seat. What's going on here? Daniel is seeing a courtroom scene and the most prominent throne among the divine thrones is where the God of gods, who he calls the Ancient of Days, takes his seat. His throne was unique because from it fiery wheels were spinning and lightning was going off and flames of fire would shoot out from before him and the the ancient Babylonian gods were said to sit upon thrones with wheels. We can see the pictures of, of, of these, these gods. And what God is showing Daniel here is this. The gods of the land where you're living are not really the ones in control, Daniel. What God is showing him here is that he, the ancient of days, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the one seated on the wheeled throne. Not Marduk. It's Yahweh. He's mocking the gods of Babylon and showing Daniel he is the God of gods. He's the one in the position of power. He's in control of history, not Babylon. It's Yahweh. And so he takes his seat, and the heavenly divine council takes its seat. And we got, I mean, the scriptures tell us tens of times, tens of thousands of, of people, of beings were before the Ancient of Days. And God judges the beast. Now, I don't have time to get into the different interpretations on beasts and Daniel and that kind of thing. You can look it up if you're curious. But the, the essential thing to understand is God is judging the entities of the world which are causing evil. He sits and he judges. Then the scene gets really weird, as if it wasn't weird enough already. Suddenly, Daniel looks and he saw one like a son of man who was coming on the clouds of heaven. This is an interesting term. In Aramaic, it's kabar anash. In Hebrew, it translates to ben adam. Ben adam literally translates son of Adam. So Daniel looks and sees a son of Adam coming on the clouds of heaven. A human being somehow has found his way into the divine courtroom. And not only, he didn't just like, can I please come in? <laughs> He's riding the clouds of heaven. He storms into the divine courtroom. Now, we need to understand, the false god Baal of the Philistines was well known as the god who rides the clouds. Everyone knew Baal was the cloud rider. So again, God is communicating to us, no, 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 Baal is not the supreme one. I am. But here we have a son of Adam surfing on the clouds of heaven and coming to the ancient of days. 
So he's, he's like a divine, he's like God riding the clouds. Only God rides the clouds in the scriptures. That's, only Yahweh is said to be the cloud rider. But here we have a Ben Adam riding the clouds of heaven. Who is this? And if that wasn't enough, we're told that this Ben Adam is the exalted one. Who is greater than even Baal? Now imagine the Philistines reading this. What? He is a human given the eternal dominion in the indestructible kingdom that every nation will serve and obey him. This son of Adam sounds a lot like God. But God is on the throne of glory. Then this Ben Adam's riding the clouds and coming to God. Like, what's going on here? Who's God? <laughs> Before becoming a believer, I thought I was really smart. I remember one time I was in Dollarama with my mother, and my older brother was encouraging her to read the Bible. Mom, you should read the Bible. You should read the Bible. You should read the Bible. And she was telling me this. And I'm like, Pfft. listen, Mom, if there's a higher power, okay, if there's a God, whatever you call him, he's way bigger than a book. I mean, how can one book contain the creator of the universe? Have you heard this before? Have you heard someone say that to you? Oh, come on, God's bigger than just the Bible. The problem is, I never actually read the Bible. And I, I can guarantee you like 99% of people who say that probably haven't read the Bible either. So here I was suggesting that the Bible had nothing relevant to say about the creator and I've never read it. I mean, many people feel this way. They rightly think the creator, well, I mean, if he created all this, he must be grand. He must be glorious. But then they wrongly conclude as a result, well, the Bible must just be like a thing. Like, well, maybe there's some good here, but it can't be like the full revelation of God. But then if you pick this thing up and you read it, you'll soon discover the God of gods is revealed in such a way as not to put him in a nice little box. You can't do it. Reading this book about the God in this book is not to put him in a box because the book doesn't put him in a box. He's a paradox, which doesn't fit in a box. I feel like Dr. Seuss up here. He's incomprehensible. He's relational. How is that possible? How can you be incomprehensible and relational? He sits upon a fiery throne of glory high above all other gods, but he's... He's a son of Adam. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sons of Adam. I, I counted. Maybe I missed one. But God is said to be Ben Adam, like you. How? I don't know. And the more I learn about God, the more I don't know about God. The more he reveals himself to me in his word, the more my comfortable religious categories of God get blown to pieces. The ancient of days sits on his throne and he judges. Then the son of Adam comes and he sets him up as the eternal king. So here we have God in God, but he's one. We sang about the blessed trinity. This is the promise of Christmas, is it not? A son of Adam, a human being, born king of the angels. Born king above the highest beings of creation. And as Israel was in exile among a pagan and wicked nation, this promise, this paradoxical promise here, was the hope they needed. Yahweh, listen, Israel in Babylon, Yahweh's on his throne. He's still the judge. And the eternal kingdom that you're looking for will be restored by the divine Ben Adam, who will rule and reign with his people. <clears throat> Look at what verse 27 says. Uh, let's fast forward to verse 27 in, in Daniel chapter 7. In the kingdom, in the dominion, in the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions, dominions shall serve and obey him. This is an amazing passage. The everlasting kingdom of God will be given to who? Who does it say the kingdom's given to in the passage? The people of the saints, of the Most High. 
What does that imply? It implies God has purpose to populate his eternal kingdom with people. You, me. So much of what we know about heaven on a cultural level is just not biblical. Heaven is said to be this faraway place that you go to when you die. I have yet to go to a funeral where it was not suggested multiple times that the one who, who died is in heaven. But heaven is not a place where angels fly around with grapes in their hands waiting to serve you. Heaven is not a place where, you know, you sit on clouds and eat Philadelphia cream cheese. That's not heaven. Heaven, eternal life, is a lot like earth. As a matter of fact, it's called the new earth. It's like earth in many ways, minus sin, death, and corruption. People don't turn into angels or get, you know, people say, every time this happens, an angel gets its wings. No. That's not true. (laughs) You don't get wings in heaven. People are still people in the eternal kingdom. You know how I know? Because God literally, literally told us the people of the saints will get the kingdom. The Aramaic word for people is um, and it just means men and women, people, human people inhabiting an eternal kingdom. And as human beings, this is our mandate to image God. When the Bible tells us that God made us in his image, it means he made us to reflect him. He put us on earth to do the things he would do. We're put here to create, to rule, to reign. We're put here to subdue and have dominion over the earth under the authority of God himself. And God has essentially said, this is my creation. I want you to go out and rule it as princes and princesses. But of course, we know from history, our ruling and our reigning has been an epic failure. We, instead of loving each other, we abuse each other. Instead of caring for the earth, we destroy the earth. We have not imaged God well. And as a result of the sin and rebellion in our hearts towards God, he's judged us and said, you must die. Our time here has been limited because of corruption. But this is not how it ought to be. Death is an unnatural thing. People people keep say, oh, it's just natural. No, it was never meant to be natural. Life is natural. Death is not Our mandate from God to have dominion and rule and reign will be fulfilled. And it will be fully fulfilled when the people of the saints get the kingdom and rule and reign in it under the headship of the Son of Man. Although Israel was in exile, it didn't look good for the Jews. So God comes and gives Daniel this vision. He says, listen, Daniel, I know it looks bad, but there's some big things ahead. There's some big things ahead. Babylon, this crushing, imposing kingdom that was, that was uh, you know, crushing the Israelites was just a blip on the radar of history. How many people know about the kingdom of Babylon? Like, nobody. Blip on the radar. Not even worth remembering. The glory of the greatest kingdoms of men will be like rubbish. Our categories are going to be blown to pieces when we realize God made humans to rule and reign. And this may be hard to wrap our minds around, but it's God's purpose to give the kingdom to you. The divine son of Adam will make a way for the sinful sons of Adam to rule and reign forever. So let's fast forward to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who stood before religious Jews and people people who knew their Bibles well. And he said this. Go to Luke chapter 21. Look at what Jesus says to the religious Jews of his day. Luke chapter 21, verse 25. He says this, And there will be signs in, in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man, uh uh-oh, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your your redemption is drawing near. 
Jesus was a 30-something-year-old man when he said these words. He was like my age. I'm 32. But it's not like Jesus just showed up in a vacuum, right? He didn't just appear out of thin air. He was a 30-year-old Jesus, born a baby, grew, he matured, and now he is saying, hey, you guys know Daniel 7 well, right? Of course. You know the son of man, Ben-Adam? That's me. (laughs) Think about the implications of what he's saying. He says he's coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Like the weightiness of the statement, I can't understate it, or overstate it rather. What Jesus is basically saying is, listen, I am God. He's applying Daniel 7 to himself. The mystery of the Ben-Adam is cracked wide open, and the poor Jewish rabbi from Galilee says, it's me. I'm Ben-Adam. So many times we read a passage like this and we just say, amen, Jesus put it to the Pharisees again. Good job, Jesus. But it's, it's because we, we believe he's God in the flesh. And so the shock value just isn't there anymore. But put your nicely groomed 21st century feet into a 1st century Jewish sandal for a second. People knew Jesus. They knew him when he was a little boy. They knew him as a young lad when he was learning to read. They knew him, if they had bikes in the first century, they knew Jesus when he was learning to ride a bike. When he fell and he scraped his knee and he called out for for mama. Mama, oh, help me, my knee hurts. They knew Jesus then. There's some points, look, he, he spent 30 years with these people. 30 years with them. It didn't say a word about who he was. And then he just, all of a sudden, I'm Ben Adam. (laughs) Jesus wasn't a mysterious preacher who just showed up. This is why at some points in scripture it says that the people responded with apathy. They'd say stuff like, isn't this the son of Mary? We've been with him. Like, for this is the son of Mary. Who is this guy? I mean, think about this. This man was a kid. He would sit in the synagogue and learn the Bible. This Jesus, this man was a kid 15, 20 years ago. That was the kid in the synagogue. Now he's saying he's God? (laughs) Come on. Did you understand how maybe they'd be skeptical? I mean, after the miracles, at that point, maybe you'd, okay, well, (coughs) perhaps he's right. (laughs) This idea of the God man is paradoxical to us. Imagine how paradoxical it was to them. Like church, Jesus is the Ben Adam, the cloud rider, our redemption. He's Adam's son who's coming to rule and reign. He came to die and rise from the dead so we can I- inherit the kingdom of God. And Christmas is about the restoration of life. It's about God confronting our brokenness face on, literally. God put on a face to confront your sin face on. He puts on eyes and he looks us in our eyes and he says, I'm here to take your brokenness on myself. And Christmas is the great invasion. It's God invading the darkness and capturing us for himself. It's God breaking down the, the door of the strong man and saying, I own the house now. Give me what's mine. And he did it in the most peculiar of ways. Becoming a human. When we read in Daniel 7, we see a cataclysmic, dramatic scene. But then when we look at the birth of Jesus, we see a baby. We see ordinary. Aside from the virgin conception, only Mary and Joseph knew about that. Aside from that, it was ordinary. From the outside looking in, that's just another baby. But this baby would be the one who would buy us back, who would take our pain and our sin, and who would restore life back how it ought to be, boundless and eternal. Jesus is the Ben Adam, the divine son. He's coming He's come to restore our brokenness, and he's coming to make us whole again. You know, one of my favorite parts of, um, one of my favorite Christmas hymns, rather, is uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I don't think we've sung that one yet this year. And one line in that song is particularly um, powerful, at least for me. It says this, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. I mean, you could stop there. (laughs) 
Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. This baby boy was born to give us second birth. What tremendously good news. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But it's good news. And as I've preached week by week about this paradox, I'm no closer to getting it as I was before. But I am closer to God somehow. The Benadam of Daniel 7, our Lord Jesus, is coming again. And he's calling all men and women everywhere to turn from sin and trust in him. He's calling you to examine your life, reflect on your existence, and ask yourself, am I living with the end in mind? Are you imaging God well, are you rebe- or are you rebelling against him? He's opened the door for you. He's made a way. Come to him and believe and receive life. Why continue any longer going your own way? And if you trust him, when he comes... He will take you as his own, and you will rule and reign. Next week, I'm going to preach Genesis 21, and it's going to get really real. Because the way he ends is not very nice. But for this week, come to him so you don't have to deal with that judgment. So many of those who were alive at the time missed his first coming. The God of glory who was veiled in flesh will not be missed the second time. He is coming on the clouds of heaven, and it says, every eye will see him. And Daniel ends his book like this. This, I can confess, is perhaps my favorite verse in all the Bible. Daniel 12, verses 2 and 3. This is how he ends his book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12, 2 and 3. The Bible tells us those who win souls are wise. He's coming, and you will not miss him this time. Don't be among those who awake from death to shame and everlasting contempt. Be those who awake to shine like the stars forever and ever. Come to Ben-Adam, your brother. Jesus is called your brother. God is called your brother. Come to him and shine like the brightness of the stars forever. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your promise. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your word and, <clears throat> and the way you break into our darkness and bring hope. Uh, many of us might be in a spiritual Babylon ourselves, in a valley. We need hope. Lord, break through like you did for Daniel and, and remind us of the hope of your second advent when you're coming on the clouds of heaven to restore all things we want to shine like the brightness of the stars forever and ever so turn many to righteousness for us in jesus name amen